Pathfinders. So my name is Pastor AJ De Villiers, and I would like to welcome you to this online forum of honors for the Pathfinder ministry. You're here today because you're interested in learning more about what the Pathfinder ministry has in store with regards to honors. And I want to encourage you that if you would like to qualify for this honor, make sure that you subscribe to this channel, which is a bonus because you'll be receiving more information about honors that will be presented in the future. Then secondly, check the comments below and ensure that you fill in the form pertaining to this honor that you'll be watching. And remember to watch this honor completely because all the answers you need are within the video that's posted. So I hope you're going to enjoy yourself and that you'll sit back, learn a bit more and share this information with everyone that you come in contact with. May God bless you and may God keep you as you learn more about this honor that you'll be watching shortly. Enjoy. All right, once again, welcome to everybody. Um, Pastor Simon, I would like to thank you for taking your time out and everyone else for joining us. I think this is something that everyone will enjoy. And I believe that uh, we're going to learn quite a number of things today. So maybe before we can start, let's close our eyes for a word of prayer. So we can ask the Lord to be present amongst us. Let's close our eyes. Father God, thank you that you are Lord of our lives. And thank you that you've brought us together to learn more about decoding and cryptography. We pray, Lord, that you may guide us and teach us and help us to also live life to the fullest for you, Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayers and thank you for blessing us abundantly with life today. And as we go through this day, uh, some of us are ending our day, Lord. May you bless us as we head into this new week. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for always being amongst us. Even though we might not be together, we can still worship and we can still learn together, Lord. We commit our lives into your hands and we pray this in your name alone. I'd like to Amen. pray this in your name. Amen. 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 So, just an introduction. My name is Pastor AJ De Villiers. I'm the Western Region Youth Director of the Cape Conference. Pastor Bulelani Bumela is the Eastern Region Youth Director of the Cape Conference. And uh, we are here together with Pastor Simon, who will present the cryptography on it for us. So thank you, Pastor Bums. Would you like to say something? Guys, we, we, we want to welcome you this morning. Of course, it's morning in South Africa. And thank you so much, Pastor Simon, for accepting oh, the call. Uh, we wish we could have you right down here in South Africa. Uh, like I said to you on my SMS, uh, we to get you to South Africa. Uh, I look forward to going there when yes. uh, things are better, no? And of things course, are better. Of course. Um, in the same breath, we want to welcome those of us who are coming from the ends of uh, our globe. Uh, it's so nice to have you um, in, in this session. May the good Lord bless you um, as you listen and as you learn. Um, thank you. Over to you, Pastor. All right. Okay. Uh, let me just say a few things before we begin. Now, first of all, I am very, very grateful for this opportunity to be your instructor. It's such a humbling thing for me to realize that right now we have about 148 people from many countries uh, learning an honor which is pretty new uh, even though uh, it was started 10 years ago. New in the sense that it hasn't really penetrated to the whole world just because this honor is an, uh, it's an initiative of my department when I was youth director. I am in fact the creator of this honor together with seven other honors. So I created a total of eight honors. Uh, if you're interested, I can tell you what they are. Some of them are quite interesting. So cryptography has uh, been very popular. In fact, I've taught it to the British Union Conference recently, and I taught it in uh, Finland when I was at the Campuri in Finland many years ago. All right, so without further ado, let me go straight into the presentation because I need all the time. Now, uh, can, can all of you see the slide? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Can you see the slide? Okay, good. Yeah. All right, so I'll go straight into it, okay? Now, um, let me just say, this honor was created, oh, sorry, in the year 2009, okay? And, and you can actually see here a message written in the code, in the cipher known as the PIC pen code, all right? Which I hope you will take time later on to decipher it, and you should tell me what it says, okay? Uh, all right, so remember this honor, uh, 
will be yours. I mean, you will have to buy it from your conference, whatever. Oh yeah, I forgot to show you something. Uh, if you can, if you can see me, all right. I all these are actually made uh, uh, over here, as I said. So you probably won't be able to get it elsewhere, unless your conference made it. Now I also have the advanced one. Okay. Anyway, it's too small for you to see, but just to let you know, they are available from my part of the world. Now this honor, as I told you. Uh, is an initiative of the department of which I was the youth director for 15 years from 2001 to 2015 before I retired so called from the youth department but later on I went to work in Australia as a pastor. So during that time uh, because our pathfinder was so hungry for uh, knowledge we decided at every master guide convention we would create new honors and so as a result I have developed eight different honors. So this uh, Southeast Asia Union is actually made up of uh, the following country, as you can see, all right. So those countries are Brunei, Cambodia, Laos, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. So these are what we call the Southeast Asian countries, and it was officially launched uh, during our let me see, yeah, our second Master Guide Convention. Now we already have four edition now. Okay, but during my time, I organized three Master Guide Conventions for all the countries of Southeast Asia. We also have invitees from other country who came. So that second convention, Master Convention, was held in Cambodia. And here is a picture of all those who came. As you can see, all our Master Guides are wearing our A1 uniform. They look very impressive. Our uniform is dark blue. Uh, and usually in this tropical climate, when we wear our A1 uniform, we do not put on the scarf. We put on the necktie. Okay, quite a departure from the practice that you find worldwide. Uh, that's because, like I said, we are very... Uh, uh, attuned to the climate here. It's a very tropical country. It's very hot. So it does not make sense to wear what we call a double neck wear. But anyway, all right. Now, then 2019 last year, we launched the advanced cryptography Pathfinder order. Now, notice it looks different, right? This is how the basic look like and the advanced look like. So it's a departure from the norm. Normally, in the advanced classes, you simply have a star on it. Now, in this part of the world, we don't like that. Why? it looks boring to have the same honor of the same design. So that's why for the advanced classes, we purposely have a different design. So this is, when you see this uh, semaphore flex in the eighth position, this stands for the advanced cryptography honor that was officially launched 2019 during our last, and this is actually the last uh, union-wide 500 camp, the 11th, just because our union will be dissolved. You'll be split into three different uh, entities later on. Okay, so if you're interested, I can tell you what they are. So, so this is essentially the last union camp period that was last year. And during that time, I taught both the basic and the advanced. And these are all my students, and they really had a wonderful time uh, attending this class. They were so excited to learn about the fascinating skill of cryptography. All right, so let me now come back to the actual class. What you're learning today is the basic class, okay? It's not the advanced class. You need to do the basic before you can uh, move on to the advanced. Now, in the basic cryptography honor, they are all together, can you watch very carefully, 11 requirements, okay? So 11 requirements, and you will see them one by one as I go along, right? So I won't read it from here because they will all appear one by one. So remember, there are 11 requirements, and one of them involves a project, number four. You are supposed to make a sitel, all right, and I'll teach you how to make a sitel so you can send out secret messages. This is an instrument for encoding messages, okay? Uh, I will show you later on when we come to this. So this is your project that you must do. Another thing you must do for number 10 and 11 is to actually decode those secret messages which I gave you. You have to, you have to get it correct. So after teaching you how to do the transposition cipher, you will decode the message and then and I teach you the substitution cipher you will decode message the message there are a total of six messages you need to get it correct okay uh, and then you need to pass a test you need to do the shit tell so these are the three major things pass the test uh, do the shit tell project and make sure you decoded the six message correctly and when you do that you are eligible to 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 have this honor all right question number one what does the word cryptography mean? And what is the difference between steganography and cryptography? So let me start off with the first part. 
what does the word cryptography mean? All right. So let me first of all begin by telling you the word cryptography. All right. Uh, sometimes you also call it cryptology. Now, the, the it's actually uh, a very slight different. Cryptography is the study of secret writing. Cryptos is hidden or secret, and graphy from the word graphos. All right, which means writing. So secret writing, or you can say cryptology, the study of secret messages. Logi is a study. All right. So it is the art. Now, by the way, I forgot to say something. Every time you see a word that is highlighted in red, mark it. This is an exam question. So I'm giving you hint. These are the things you need to pay attention. All right. So every time you see a thing that's been marked with red, that is going to come out for your test. Okay. So be forewarned. Okay. So what is cryptography or cryptology? It is the art of concealing. That means hiding messages. Why do we need to do that? To keep them private, keep them confidential, so that the third party will not see it. Third party means a person who should not be seeing it. It is so important. It's so secret and so uh, sensitive information. You therefore write it in a way that is hidden, right? That no one will actually even know what it is. So. It involves what we call the process of encoding. That means you put it into a code. The, the ordinary text that we call the plain text, or it's also called the normal text, so that you make them into what we call a cipher text. Okay, A cipher text means it has already become uh, uh, encoded or what we call encrypted, which become unintelligible and cannot be read. -read. It is, in fact, gibberish. Okay, Now, let me uh, show you what I'm talking about. So here is the plain text. The normal text okay run away quickly that's the message i want to send to you but because we do not want third parties to see it it's only meant for you so therefore i use what we call the process of encrypting and encoding using a variety of tools now by the way i know probably about 30 or 40 a different uh, uh, encoding skill that's because it has been my hobby for well over 40 years now you know the, this is my hobby so i know many many of these um, uh, methods of encoding in most of it I can do off my head without referring to books. So here is a message run away quickly when you encrypt it or a, a, you use a code to conceal it then it becomes something like this. Can you see? This is actually the same message run away quickly but look at what it has become. This is what we call the cipher text or the coded text and, and it's totally what I call unintelligible. No one will know what on earth this thing is unless as you will find out later on, you have what we call the key. You need to have the key to open up this message, the process of decoding. So you must have the key. So that's very, very important. All right. So when you receive a message like this, because you were already told what the key is to open this, you know what uh, code I use. So you use the same code to decode it, to unravel or unwrap the message. And so that's what we call decrypting. Or decoding so the opposite of encrypting or, or encoding would be decrypting and decoding so this is putting into the code and this is taking it out of the code so that what so that this message again becomes the plain text so now we notice this message is exactly what the person sent to you so this message the plain text should match the original text if you have done a good job in decrypting now remember you all depend on whether you got the right key. You need to know what code was used and use the same code to decode it. All right. Now, uh, here is another, another uh, uh, here, here is an example of the code I use. And it's called the magenta twin code. Now, as I said, I know manual code. These are things I created myself. And I call it the magenta twin code. So when you are more comfortable, you want to learn all these things, I can show you how to do this, all the different codes. And I tell you, they are simply amazing. So cryptography protects vital or sensitive information from third parties. All right, it can be used also for fun. Now, at the end of this class, I'll show you how we use it for fun. Oh, especially for treasure hunt, for to find hidden treasure, okay? Uh, and Vacation Bible School, you know, the kids love it, right? If you know how to use uh, coded messages, instead of telling people where, the thing is you use a code and they have to take time to so-called decode the message and then they know where the thing is hidden. And this is much more fun than, than just telling them where the treasure is. All right. 
Now, so as I said, it's so important that you remember this. In cryptography, you need the what? The key. So you have to be given the key. The key simply means the secret as to how to decode it. In other words, I'm telling you what code I use to write that message. So when you register, You need the key. The key refers to the original code that was used. So this is another thing you need to remember. So in cryptography, what do you need? You days ago. Now, this is the original message, run away quickly, but notice when I use the black twin code, it becomes like this. When I use the magenta twin code, it becomes like this, all right? Navy blue code, it becomes like this. And as I told you, all of this I can do off my head. I don't need to refer to any books, all right? That's because, as I said, uh, I have mastered all these things. It will come off my head very easily. So uh, you give me any message, I can apply any of the code and make it into what we call gibberish, and nobody will know what it is, unless I told you what the key is, all right? Right, so these are all example of the different application of the codes that I have created. And of course, you can come up with your own or you can learn more codes. I'll be teaching at least half a dozen codes today. All right, now we have studied about cryptography. Now you need to understand what stereography is all about. Now these two are both related, except there's one major difference, okay? Even though both are in the business of hiding the message, stereography is much more sophisticated. It requires much more work. Why? Because here in stereography, it is the art of hiding the secret message. Now, remember, with a cover. In other words, there is actually a message here. Now, look at this painting here. You have no idea that this innocent cover, there is actually a message hidden there. So what people see is just a painting. But remember, this is only a cover hiding a message behind. So the actual message is actually hidden by a very seemingly innocent looking cover. So, stereography is the art of hiding the secret message using what? Remember the keyword, cover. So that what people see is the cover without realizing that there is actually a secret message hidden within the cover. So today I'm gonna to give you at least three examples of stereography, all right? Uh, you will see that. But before that, let me tell you again the different, the three differences between cryptography and stereography. In cryptography, it's very obvious. The moment you see a message like this, you know it has been encoded. You know that someone has taken the trouble to make it into a secret message. You see, this is actually the word Pathfinder, but look at what happened. Using the codes that I have applied, it has become like this. And anyone looking at this message, you immediately arouse suspicion. Ah, oh, there's something hidden there. So that is the weakness about cryptography. The, what is the weakness? It arouses suspicion that the moment people see it, they know there is something hidden, that there must be a hidden thing. So that is the weakness of a cryptography. cryptography. But in yeah. psychography, it's so normal. Nobody actually knows that there is a hidden message, you see? So that's the strength and the good point about psychography. So as I was saying, unlike cryptography, the gonography does not attract attention to themselves because why? The thing looks so normal, so ordinary that no one suspects that there's a hidden message there. Now, for example, if you see this thing, curves, group, and view, right? If you just see these three uh, words, curves, group, and view, by the way, did you notice something? Every one of them are five letters, okay, uh, curves. One, two, three, four, five, and then group one, two, three, four, five, and then envy one, two, three, four, five. And I have hidden a message in every word that is actually five letter long. So so the actual message is actually run. And nobody actually knows that wow, curbs, group, and view actually means run. Now I'm gonna show you how these are done. Okay, now this is a method that I created. Like I said, you can come up with your own on method to do stereography. All right, now, by, before I continue, let me come to the third difference. Cryptography basically protects the content of the message, all right? In other words, the message is protected 
nobody knows what's inside. But it does not protect you because you will be exposed. Immediately people know you are up to something. See, so steganography has the advantage of not only protecting the contents of the message, but it protects the communication parties with you and me. If I send a message to you and you send it to me, we don't want to arouse suspicion. We don't want it to be detected. So no wonder we use steganography writing in such a way that it looks so normal, so ordinary, that it does not arouse suspicion. It does not uh, uh, say, hey, something is fishy is going on. See, that is the beauty behind steganography. Now, the problem of, about steganography, it requires a lot of thinking, a lot of work. You need to put in much more effort. Okay, so today, I will show you a few examples. Now, lastly, if I were to illustrate steganography and cryptography, I will put it this way. Cryptography is just like putting your money into a safe box. Everybody knows there's money in a safe box. So you know what I'm saying? So that is the problem of cryptography. It immediately arouse or create attention to itself. All right. So if you don't put money in the safe box, people know. But when you hike it in a, some way in the bed or in some corner of your house, now that would be what we call cryptography because nobody knows that behind that bed or uh, behind that 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 uh, towel on the floor there is a message hidden. So it will not attract attention. You see what I'm saying? So graphography is just like hiding your money under the bed and cryptography is putting your money in the vault or in the safe where everybody knows that there is bound to be money there. So one does not attract attention, one immediately attracts attention, all right? Okay, now the most simple example of the graphography will be what we call the scrabble board. Look very carefully at this thing. It looks like a scrabble board, but essentially what it is, it is a camouflage. You know, it's a camouflage. You are hiding it using this scrabble board. You know that this is, there is a message there. So again, for the casual observer, they would have thought, oh, sites, coated, new bag, buying, petals, forest. So they, they must be wondering either someone is playing scrabble or it is advertising something. Now, guess what? Within this so-called scribble board, there is a hidden message. And this is where you need to apply what I call the, uh, the grill. All right, now this is the grill. The moment you see, you, you do not know which letter is the one that, com that consists, uh, that, that composes a message. But when you apply the grill on it, now this is the grill with the cut-off holes, you see, when, if I give you this grill and then you apply this thing over this thing, guess what happened? Immediately the message appears. See? T. You remember early on? T is here. All right. What's this? All right. A. So now you see the message is this T A N G I E R S. Let's just say I'm telling you, hey, this is where we're going to meet next month. Where's the meeting place? If you do not want anybody to know, so I send you this scrabble board. Now, again, nobody will actually know that it's to be the meeting place, the venue is tangious. But because you were given this so-called grill and you apply this grill or you put the grill over that scrabble board, immediately the message comes out. And you now know that the place we are supposed to meet is tangious. By the way, tangious is a city in Morocco and it was such a famous city during World War II. Because to tell you the truth, tangious, is what we call the spy capital of the world. All the spies of the world uh, actually are found in Tangiers during World War II for some reason. So that's why Tangiers to this day is still known as the spy capital of the world, Morocco, which is in Northern Africa. All right, I've been there. All right, so look again. Without the grill placed on it, you will not, no one would know that there's actually a secret message. And this is an excellent example of steganography. It looks so normal looks so innocent, looks so ordinary, it does not attract attention. But guess what? The moment you apply the grill, then you see there was actually a hidden message. All right, you see? You see, this was a hidden message. But if you don't have the grill, you wouldn't know that. You see, you wouldn't know that at all. So that is the beauty about steganography. All right, so this is example number one. Now, example number two. I can send you a... Uh, uh, I mean, I can write a paragraph 
It looks like a children's story. But guess what? What, what happened? Within this so-called children's story is a coded message. Now, let's look at the message, the student story that I wrote. By the way, this is my, my own creation, okay? So let me, let's look at it. As a champ, Tom understands oaths, you know, promises. They imply balancing on the eight curves, bearing the image of the girl. Now, of course, it's all nonsense, okay? This gutsy boy has had a crush for so long, yet no entry was permitted to a home because he has to bear the anvil of the oats of a dwarf, you know, so this guy's a dwarf. Now, it looks like a children's story, okay? In fact, it's a rather bizarre, very weird story. But guess what happened? You will receive the message, was already given the key. You were already given the secret how to decode it by looking at all the words which are five letter long. So look very carefully. What are those words which are five letter long? Cham, oats, imply, you see, eight, curbs, image, gutsy, crush, entry, right, and then anvil, oats, and the last one, dua. So the first thing you do the moment you receive this message, knowing that I'm using what we call the five letter word code, right? So you need to delete all those other things which are not five letters long. So now again, you see, these are the letters. Cham, oats, imply, eight, curves, image, gutsy, crush, entry, anvil, oats, dua. So, once you find out what those things are, you can delete all the rest, right? So you don't need all the rest, okay? All these things are nonsensical. They are simply a camouflage. Remember, do you understand what I'm saying? So they were, this were just ways to conceal the message. So this is the actual message. But again, you see, this is a two-level uh, steganography. So you must now know that each of them right, has got an alphabet, and you need what I call the code book now. So here, is the code book that I send you. So when you see the word cham, all right, you look for cham. Oh, so actually cham is actually the letter C. Oats is actually letter O. Imply is actually letter M. Eight is actually E. Curves is actually R. You understand? So it's not always the first letter. Image is I. Crush is actually H. Entry is actually T. And view is actually N, oats, as you really know, is O, and dwarf is actually W. Now, remember, you were given this code book. So, when you receive any of these things, you see, okay, imply the code, the word, the alphabet should be M. Lanky is actually L. Obeys is actually S. You see, so this is, this is part of your what I call key. So, now that you have done that, guess what happened? You now can erase all those things which are not. Uh, Part of the thing. Remember now, I'm going to erase all these things. So now this is what what is left. You see what I'm saying? Because you don't need you don't need the rest. You only need the one that is highlighted in red based on the code book that I gave you, right? So now, so this is what is left. So what is the message? Can you see it? C O M E. So that's come. R I G H T, right, and then N O W, N O W now. So, what is the message? The message simply is come right now. Can you see it? So, this is what I told you uh, an excellent example of steganography in which the message is hidden, right, in something so innocent. It looks like a children's story, but guess what? Within this children's story is a secret message which you need to decode by first looking at all the words which are five letter long and then using the code book, find out what is the alphabet that you need to look for. And using this code book now, you know, it's actually C-O-M-E, R-I-G-H-T, and N-O-W. And the message therefore is come right now. So. Now you have already two examples of the chronography. You saw the grill, remember the grill? 
this is the grill thing, all right? You already saw this thing that is, uh, right, applying over the scraper board. So that's method number one. And then method number two will be using what I call the five letter code word, all right? Now, here's another example. Now, this one I just came up with three days ago because I was trying to teach something new for this class. You know, I don't like to teach the same thing. So this is something new. What's that? I'm combining my knowledge of vexillology, which is a study of flag, with cryptography. All right, ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and sisters, pathfinders and master guides, what you see are six flags of the world. But because you were trained in steganography, I trained you and you know that the flag is not the flag, there is a message between the flags. All right, so then you are able to unravel and decode the message. So let us start off by asking, Hey, what on earth is this? By the way, do you know what these six flags are? Let, let me tell you what the six flags are. This first flag is the flag of Cyprus. This one, the maple leaf, is Canada. This double black uh, eagle is the flag of Albania, right? Albania. This is the flag of uh, Armenia, which is, these are all in Eastern Europe, okay? This is the flag of Palestine, okay? The Palestinians. And this is the flag of a country in Asia, in the Himalayas, Bhutan. So you have, you have Cyprus, Canada, Albania, uh, Armenia, uh, this uh, Palestine, and Bhutan. So here they are, all right, can you see it? Cyprus, Canada, Albania, Armenia, Palestine, and Bhutan. But guess what? You can't find a message just by thinking that, oh, therefore you must be C, C, A, and A. This is not a thing. Here is where you need to go one step level, one step lower, I mean deeper. And that is, you know, you must know the capital of each of this country. So I can tell you right now, the capital of Cyprus is Nicosia. The capital of Canada is Ottawa. The capital of Albania is Tirana. The capital of Armenia is Yerevan. The capital of Palestine or Palestine is East Jerusalem, not Jerusalem, East Jerusalem. And the capital of Bhutan is Timpul. All right, so now here it is, right? Nicosia, Ottawa, Tirana, Yerevan, East Jerusalem, and Timpul. Now, these are all the capitals of these six countries, and this is where the message is. So, Nicosia, Ottawa, Tirana, Yerevan, East Jerusalem, and Tipu. So, look at the first letter. That's all you need to do. So, what is the message? N O T Y E T. Message, not yet. <laughs> Can you see it? So, nobody would even know that when I send you these six flags, I'm telling you we are not yet ready for the operation or for the mission. Right, so within this six flag, the secret message is not yet, okay? Because what happened, I'm using the flags and I'm telling, telling you to look for the capital of each of the country, right? So make sure you are able to know the country's capital. And once you have it, then you look at the first letter and immediately you know N-O-T, not Y-E-T. So not yet, right? So now I hope you should be quite clear what the geography is. Now let me tell you a real life story of how Stagonography was actually used for espionage. Espionage is spying. This lady, Vevali Dickinson, okay, was born in 1893 and died in 1980 at a quite old age, was convicted of being a spy for the, for the Japanese all right, during World War II. Now remember she's an American working in New York City, but she was working as a spy during World War II for America. And she is known as the doll lady or the doll woman. Why? Because she was selling dolls. She was doing a business involving the buying and selling of dolls, okay, in New York City, right? Uh, and guess what happened? This was actually a cover from that doll shop of hers. She was encoding messages, secret messages, and sending to Japan sensitive military information that she got and she sent it through her contacts in Argentina, all right, via the messages, right? So then 
guess, no, by the way, this was the actual shop, okay? You see, about Wally Dickinson, this was the actual doll shop. You can even see the dolls on the shop before she was arrested. But one day, guess what happened? She was arrested. Because what happened? One of her contacts in Buenos Aires, the capital of Argentina, had moved away and she didn't know that. And her message was therefore returned to her. And that was intercepted. And then people saw it. And they knew that something is fishy. And by the way, um, the American were wondering how come the Japanese seem to have knowledge ahead of them, that they knew exactly the military operation, that what they were doing, that the Japanese seemed to already know. So they knew that there, was, there, would be a, there must be a spy somewhere. And so they were looking all over the place. And then when they discovered this message, and using very top-notch group, Crypto analysts who are real expert in decoding messages, they discover within this so-called very ordinary message, actually there is a message. And that message is this. I just secured information on an aircraft carrier warship. It has been damaged. That is torpedo. So that means it's been bombed, torpedo in the middle. But it's now repaired. Okay. And then they could not get a mate for this, that means a captain for it, eh? for the so-called plane ordinary warship is being converted into a second aircraft carrier. So this is a very vital military message. And she was sending it to Japan, right? And by the way, true enough, when the crypto analysts look at actually what's happening, there was indeed a damaged warship, the USS Saratoga, huh? which was being repaired. Which was being repaired, okay, in, uh, in, um, uh, in this place called Puget Sound, right? And then it was being transferred to the naval base in San Diego. So then they knew that indeed that they had gotten the answers correct. That because it actually messaged what was actually happening. And that's how she was arrested. I mean, she was uh, arrested and spent time in prison, okay? So all right, with, with that, let me come to question number two. Now, here are four terms you must know when you study about cryptography and Cryptology, you must, you must like be acquainted with five terms, not four terms. What is encryption? What is decryption? What is plain text? What is ciphertext? And what is crypto analyst? Now, these four you actually already know because I did mention it. But anyway, let me say this again. Encryption, also called encoding, is mm -hmm. the process of converting information known as the plain text. The plain text means the normal text, remember? into what we call unintelligible messages or gibberish, right? Known as what we call the ciphertext. So what is encryption? Converting the plain text, the normal text, which is John, into a, what we call a ciphertext, a code. And so John becomes BXCA. Now this is gibberish. Nobody will know what on earth is this. This is totally unintelligible, right? So what is encryption? Converting plain text into ciphertext through the process of a code. Now, likewise, description is the exact opposite. So now remember the keyword here. What is description? It is the reverse, the reverse process where we convert what we call the unintelligible text, the ciphertext, back into the plain text. So when we get this message, we apply the key. Then we solve the puzzle, and then this is what called decryption. We found the answer that the answer was actually John. So now it can be read. So description is what reversing the process of encryption. Put it simply, decryption is reversing encryption. Okay, or making the message come out, the secret message to make it appear into the normal text. Right. So. That is what I want to say concerning uh, this thing. Now, we, uh -oh, what is happening to the screen? Some, all right. So what is crypto analysis? Crypt, hmm, did somebody draw on my screen? I some, see some funny things there on the screen. Huh? OK, hold on. All right. Now, let's come to the, to the next thing. What is crypto analysis? This is such an amazing skill. You have to be extremely bright super intelligent intelligent to be a crypto analyst you see you know why to be a crypto analyst means you were given a message like this but guess what happened 
no key was given to you. Without any key at all, you have to break the message. And in other words, you have to search like crazy to find the correct key to so-called reverse it so that it can become the plain text. So crypto analysis analysts are very smart people. You know why? Because they were not given the key. And yet what happened? They find ways and means to convert the cipher text, which is the hidden text, back into the plain text. In other words, their job is to unlock the messages without the key. You see, can you imagine? You come to a house that's locked, but you were not given the key. So you have to be very smart how to find a way to so-called unlock that house, okay, which has been locked by this thing and you don't have a key. So but crypto analysis basically is to unlock something without having the key. And it is something that requires a lot of intelligence, a lot of ingenuity and creativity to be able to do that. All right. Now we come to the third question. I hope we've been recording and writing down all these notes because this will come up for a test, okay? Number three, what is the original meaning of the word cipher? Remember the word cipher? Uh, I told you cipher means hidden text or the, or the coded message. So what, where do we get the word cipher from? You'll be surprised to know uh, the word cipher is actually an Arabic word. It's from Arab. And what does it mean? And by the way, this is how it's written in Arabic. Cipher, which is actually cipher in Arabic, means empty or zero. Now notice I highlighted this, remember? So what does cipher actually means in the original language which is Arabic? It means zero. In other words, you make it into nothing. You make the message, the hidden message, into nothing. So nobody knows there is a hidden message there. So that's really what a cipher is. The plain text, the normal text, has been made into something that doesn't that nobody knows is even there. You have make it into zero or you make it what I call empty. Right? So that's what the word cipher means in the original language, the Arabic word sipa. It means empty or what? Zero. So that's where the word cipher come from. Okay, now question number four. Now we come to the, the part where you need to be very attentive because part of your requirement is to make this sitel. So I will tell you what a sitel is, okay? What is a sitel and then make a sitel to send a secret message to someone? Right, so that's one of the things you need to do. So you make one and show the message to your director or to your conference director or whatever, okay? Or if you are from outside South Africa and you want me to test you, you're gonna make it, do a video, or you can take pictures of it and show it to me. Then I know you have actually completed this project, the CTEL. All right, CTEL. Now, the CTEL is a very old encoding tool, an instrument that is used to Right, secret messages. And the word sitel comes from the Greek word baton, a, a baton. A baton simply means a stick, okay? All right, such as this thing or, or a rod. So the word sitel comes from what word? The Greek word for what? A baton, okay? So that's, or some people pronounce it a baton, okay? So a sitel comes from the Greek word baton. And this was a tool used by ancient Greeks and the Spartans of Italy eh, to write secret messages. It consists of a cylinder, which is actually the so-called baton, with a strip of parchment, which is the paper, wound, that means wrapped around it, around it, which is written a message in three or more columns. Now you notice, you see, troops to southern flank. You notice row by row, you notice that? Troops to, and then, southern and then flank and then uh, you, you turn it behind and you can keep writing writing so what you do is that you wrap this parchment or paper around the sitel and then you write it column by column now you will see a video of what i mean right now so you wrap it around for example this pencil and on this part of the pencil you write the message you put the message here and then when you finish writing this thing you turn another uh, 45 degree or, or you, you turn it uh, one third way or 45 and then you write the second column then you turn it one more time you write the third column or, or if you want four column 
But guess what happened? Each time you write it is on the vertical column, right? But the moment you unwrap this piece of paper that was, you see, you, you wrap it around, you can see one thing, you wrap this around here and then you write a message. But the moment you unwrap it, what will happen is that the whole thing becomes jumbled up. Totally gibberish. Nobody will know what that thing is all about. Right? And the only way to understand that message is to put this parchment on that cylinder or on the stick and slowly wrap it around to see if you can find the message. Okay? Now you will see what I'm talking about. All right, so uh, instead of actually uh, going on, let me now actually show you the video, how this thing comes about, okay? So now let's watch the video, and I hope you can see how I made a CTL, and this is your project, okay? Here goes. Uh, Pastor Simon, it seems like... Oh, yeah. Okay, what happened? The yeah, sound what happened? Is off. Oh, maybe the sound is not loud enough. Huh? Yes, maybe uh, try again. Okay, I thought it was really louder. So any other way I can make it louder? Okay, let's hope. Okay. Okay, is it better now? No, the audio is, is still off, Pastor. When we tested it, it worked earlier, so... Uh -huh. So it's not loud enough, is it? No, there's no audio. The audio oh, isn't coming no, through. There's no audio. Oh. oh, there's no audio. Uh, what actually happened? Let me see what actually happened. Maybe uh, there must be a reason for that. Uh, let me see. Yeah? You might have to tick your audio box as Cicely has uh, indicated. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, let's see, what can I do? Thank you, Cicely. Oh, I have no idea that there was no sound. Uh, yeah, it's really maximum. It's really maximum. Uh, why is that no sound? Just now I was working with we were testing, isn't it? Okay, let me try it again. Uh, it was working, yes, when we tested it earlier. Okay, let, okay. let me tell me whether you can hear it. Okay. Oh boy, what actually? What actually? Oh, uh, is it because? So, okay, let's see whether. Can you hear it? Hello, Pat. Find this. Okay, yes. is it better now? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. A cetel is a tool that we can, can you hear? And it was created by the ancient Roman soldiers, right? And it was also used by the Spartan soldiers and Egyptians. We're talking about thousands of years ago. Now, the cetel is simply a cylinder like this. Uh, let me know. Can you hear? Uh, you right? Yes, it's working tool. fast. Okay, it's working now? Yes. Right? There's a reason why I did that. Now, then the other thing you will need is a long strip of paper. So here it is, a long strip of paper, which I actually cut from an A4 size paper, divided it into half, right? And then cut it, and then divide it into half again. So you have four long strip of paper, tape it side by side, and then you have a long strip of paper. Now, what I've also done is that I have actually uh, so -called draw a black line on the sides of the paper. So this is for contrast purposes, so you can see it easier when I wrap it around this cylinder. Right. The third thing you will need is tape. So make sure you have a tape dispenser here because you will need tape. And of course, the last thing is a pen, a marker to write the message on. So, all right, without further ado, let me actually show you how this will be done. Right. Now, the first thing you will need to do is actually to remember where the starting point is. All right. So here is my starting point. Right. So you can see here the so called lines. The the black lines on both sides of this piece of paper. Put it at a 45 degree at the top of the cylinder, okay? Can you see it? It's like this, okay? It's like this. Now then, on the sides, now it's very important that you mark this, all right? So when I mark it, look very carefully, there is a 45 degree here. And so you match that, in, that uh, angle of the paper to get with it, and then you tape it, okay? You pick a piece of tape and you tape it. So now this is what I've done. Okay. Hope you can see it. Right? See it. Okay. Now then I've also uh, marked the site where I've taped it. And now with this you can start uh, 
wrapping this piece of paper around the cylinder known as a setel. Now, when you wrap it around, be very careful, okay? Make sure that the distance between the paper is about one inch, okay? Now, I hope you can see it. It's about one inch. Okay, I turn it around so you can see it. Okay, now this will require a little bit of adjustment so that all around is about one inch, okay? Now, okay, you can see it slowly. Now, along the way, you have to adjust it so it is perfectly about one inch apart from each other. Right, now when you come to the last part of it, okay, by the way, let me just space it out a little bit. So that it's exactly approximately one inch apart. Now you can see it here, right? Because this is where we will write the message on it later on. Now, where it ends, okay, it's very important, okay, tape it again, right, so that you will not move. All right, so now you have got a roll up, uh, something like that, sit down. In which you can start to write messages on this. So let me now show you where I would write now. First of all, you can decide whether to write it on four sides of this of, of this uh, cylinder, four columns, or you can decide to write on three columns. Now, in this case, I will decide to write on three columns. So what I have done is that I've marked the three sides. Okay, so I remember exactly where the three sides is. Okay, and uh, that will make it easier for me later on, right? Now, let me show you again so I did it. Three side here and here, right? So, watch very carefully here, right? I have marked it here and then it here again and it here. Now, where the markings are, that's where I'll be writing the message. And the message that I'm going to write is this message, right? The bridge, the, no, bridge is not guarded. The bridge. The bridge is not guarded, okay? B R B R I D G E, and then it's not guarded, okay? So watch how I did it. Okay, starting from where I marked that part, okay? I hope you can see it, right? Now, this is where I will start writing the message from the very first part, all right? So the first word is bridge. So it will be exactly B R, okay? I D. G, G. Now, hope you can see it. Now, make sure it is straight in the column. And now move, right, uh, to the next place. Remember, I'm going to write it in three columns. Okay, so I'm going to make sure this is exactly in three columns. Okay, now let me write the third one. Okay, bridge is not guarded. Okay, so here is the first part here. So I'm going to write the second part here. Is I, S, and then and O T. So I hope you can see the word is not. And now I'm going to move another uh, to the another part to write the third column in between this column and this is guarded. So I'm going to write the word guarded here. G U A R D E. All right, so I've written a message, right? Now, of course, all of us can see it and understand it because it is still on the setel. Now, watch what happened. Okay, now let me show you the message again. Reach, right? Okay, and then you can see the word is not, and then you got the G U A R D E D. Now, watch what happened. What happened when I removed the tape, okay, from the last part where I wrote it? Okay, from where I ended the word garden. Okay, so I'm going to remove the tape right now. Okay, so when you unwrap it, something is going to happen. The whole message becomes scrambled. And that is the whole purpose of the sitel, to make the message scrambled now. Watch very carefully. Right, so now I have unwrapped this whole piece of paper. And so what you have right now, as you can see here, is a totally what I call unintelligible message. Nobody would know what it means because the message is entirely scrambled. Can you see it? It's totally scrambled. So anyone re getting this piece of paper will have no idea what that secret message is, right? You see how smart it is? The bridge is not guarded, has become gibberish, right? Totally gibberish. So what happened? When the other part 
party receive this strip of paper. Now he must have the same identical cylinder like this. He must have the same identical cylinder with the same marking so you know exactly where the starting point to put back that piece of paper in order to unravel the message. So I'm going to do that right now. So as you can see, this is the starting point with the markings here, right? And the place where you can see that slash sign, which is at a 45 degree, and it must match this line exactly. So I tape it back, right? This should be correct now. Now, as you can see here again, the so-called uh, angle here. And then this will require a little bit of uh, effort, okay? So wrap it very slowly back to it to see whether you can read the message, see whether the message comes up. Remember, it has to be one inch apart. So I'm going to build it right now. Yeah, I can see the message right now, okay? That means I've got it correct. Now I can actually see the message, okay? Okay, let me finish it and you can see the entire message. Remember, the message is the bridge. The bridge is not guarded, okay? So, now, here it is. And now I'm going to tape it back, right? So you can actually see the message. Now, as you can see, if the other party on the other side, when he received that long strip of paper or the parchment, and if you have an identical cylinder, and you will be able to wrap that gibberish, uh, so called long strip of parchment, which today is a piece of paper, around it exactly the way it was wound on the other side, right? You will see this message appear, right? B R I D G, which is bridge. And if you turn it, it says I S N O T is not. And then you see the word garden, G U A R D E D. That means this soldier from this uh, other side of the battle is communicating to the other side. You can actually come in. The bridge is not done. So I hope now you know how to make a sitel. Right? This is a very yeah. simple chip that was used in the ancient world. All right, and this is what we call two. <coughs> I hope you practice it and you have lots of fun with this tool. All right, thank you. All right, uh, is have everybody uh, uh, I understand what a sitel is right now? Can I hear some feedback from all of you, brother AJ? Was it clear? It was clear to me, Pastor. I got all that. It was good. <laughs> okay, good, good. Uh, that means the audio was working very well, huh? Okay. Yes, I think, I think some people might have struggled a little bit with their audio, but uh, they'll be oh. able to access the audio afterwards. Um, okay, so all right. They'll be able okay. to go back to the video on YouTube and get all the information that you're sharing. And we'll be good. also be good. see if we can upload the, um, the PowerPoint so that they can mm -hmm. receive the PowerPoint on the YouTube channel as well. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. And so now let me come to requirement number five. Now, when also, you study I photography, say, also, so, somebody say, yes, yes. Joseph. Yeah. I yeah. have, I have noticed on your, uh, presentation of the video that it's a mirror image. So, the message you're writing on the um, oh, I see, you know, I see. You, you turned I it, see. you turned it, the, uh, I see. You turn it to the right. <laughs> I see. On the video, it looks like you turned it to the right. Okay. Like you're writing. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback. But I think basically all of you understand that concept. Isn't it true, huh? Writing down the message in columns uh, on that wound up piece of paper. That's that's the whole concept. Okay. So I think most of you will understand this. Right. Thank you, Brother Joseph. I have no idea about that. Okay, so now come to question number five now, okay? What is the Enigma machine and how was the Enigma coded message finally decoded? When people study cryptography, you are bound to hear the famous story of the Enigma, which is the most, is considered the smartest machine ever created sorry, so far to encode messages so that nobody know what those messages, messages are all about, right? And this was actually created by the Germans during World War One, and it was used effectively during World War One and again during World War Two. And for a long, long time, those um, parties, the Western uh, so-called alliance, led by America, Britain, and so on, they could not, they could not uh, decipher what the message uh, was all about. By the way, I'm seeing some strange uh, thing on the screen is there somebody writing on the screen board or what okay never mind okay all right okay 
Now, this here is an actual Enigma machine that is considered priceless right now. It's a very valuable thing to find, all right? And you only find it today in a, a museum, right? A military museum, okay? Now, an Enigma machine is an electrical mechanical rotor machine used for encryption and decryption of secret messages during World War I and World War II. Now, if you watch very carefully, this machine has got three roto, right? That means each time you type a message, you type a word, then you use the first roto. And then by the time you type again, you'll be the second roto. Type again, you'll be the third roto. So in other words, the same letter A will appear totally different all the time. Okay? So, so, all right? Now, the first Enigma machine was invented by this German person. Now remember, it's a German engineer, and his name is Arthur Scherbius at the end of World War I, and he is considered a real genius. But remember, this was World War One. World War One. It was still quite, uh, yes? Sorry for interjecting right now. I think someone is writing on their screen. Yes, and, uh, I know. I wonder who they is that. Need huh? to, they need to stop doing that because I'm yeah. going to change the security then because if we're not going to work together, it's not yeah. coming out as nice as what, as what it's supposed to be. Yeah, I know. Um, Someone is... Uh, I wonder why they're doing that. Don't, don't touch the screen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. you know, because I was wondering why are there all kinds of scribbles on my screen. <laughs> okay. Someone must yeah. be playing a fool. I really hope that person stops doing that. Okay. All right. Yes. Because this is quite a serious class. Thank you so much. You know. All right. All right. Okay. Now, this man... Uh, by the name Arthur Schubert, a German, was the one credited of making the first Enigma machine during the end of World War I. And, you know, and it was so difficult to crack. But then the later uh, version of it was even worse, was even harder to crack. And so for a long, long time, the Allied forces, the American, the British, and all those other people, they could not crack those secret messages used by the German military. All right? And now, let me show you the famous uh, Enigma machine through a video so you will know what how incredible this uh, machine is okay is, can you hear everyone yes this is coming through standard machine for encoding their messages the cyber machine it was developed in the early 1920s as a handy tool for businessmen to keep commercial messages secret. It was powered by a battery. Its encoded messages were transmitted in Morse code to be decoded on a second Enigma machine at the receiving end. The critical element of the machine was three rotors, which could be set to scramble the message in a way which could only be unscrambled by another machine with the same settings. As a result, each letter typed would come up in any one of 150 million ways. Given the almost infinite number of settings, it was not surprising that the Germans remained convinced throughout the war that Enigma was uncrackable. <laughs> It was the Poles who took the first steps in solving this baffling puzzle. They knew of the existence of the Enigma machine and assembled a team of top mathematicians to crack it. Marian Rzewski, Jerzy Rzewski, and Henry Zygalski. But the team could not decipher messages without knowing the internal wiring of the rotor. The solution was supplied by French intelligence, which sent its Polish allies material gathered by a spy in the German army's cyber department. Amongst this was an Enigma man. The Poles were able to reconstruct an Enigma machine and began laboriously decoding messages. By July 1939, Hitler was sounding increasingly threatening towards Poland. Britain and 
France had promised to come to his aid. It was clear that war was coming. So intelligence officers from the three allies met in Warsaw. There, the British and French were astonished at how much the Poles had done in decoding Enigma, and the Poles agreed to send two of their reconstructed machines to London. Just two weeks after they were handed over, Poland was invaded. Uh, photographers have destroyed all evidence of their work on the Enigma. Some were captured and tortured, but none revealed what they'd been up to. The task was now taken up by the British at their government code and cyber school at Bletchley Park near London. All right. Okay. Uh, let me try the screen again. I, I, I try to erase those scribbles. Hopefully that it will not, uh, uh, not, not appear again. Can, uh, can you hear me again, uh, brother? Yes, Pastor. We can, we can okay. hear you. All right. Okay. So good. Now the thing is gone. Uh, I just hope that whoever that fella is will stop doing what he's um, doing. Sorry, okay? Pastor uh, AJ. Yes. Pastor AJ. Yes. Um, could you please mute everyone from your device? Because people keep yeah. on unmuting themselves and it causes friction. Please. So I, yeah, um, I'm okay. I am busy unmuting everyone, but they keep on unmuting themselves. So I'm checking the whole time who's unmuting themselves, and I remute oh, remute them. I so see. we are on that. It might just take a little bit of a few seconds to get them unmuted. Okay. But if people need uh -huh. to stop playing with their devices. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Okay. AJ. All right. All right. Okay. All right, everyone, please cooperate, okay? Uh, so that this class will run smoothly. All right, so here's the thing. Now that you know how that incredible machine is, it was considered foolproof, very, very difficult to crack. But, you know, the first group of people who were pretty much uh, successful in cracking the early, now I'm, remember I'm talking about the one that was used in World War I. The early machine were these three Polish gentlemen, okay? The Polish, the Polish uh, from Poland, crypto analysts were the very first one to crack the early Enigma mes messages. In fact, by 1934, the Polish were even able to produce their own Enigma machine. And then because of World War II, when the Germans invaded Poland, they had to stop what they were doing. But fortunately, before that, they were able to pass uh, uh, what they have learned to the British. And so as a result of that, later on and also and also because the code book used by the germans were found in some of the ship captured by the allied forces you see the submarine the ship they found not only the code book they also found the enigma machine and uh, starting from uh, 1941 and as a result this helped the british people the team of crypto analysts right through the leadership of alan turing now by the way this is one person you must remember, Alan Turing. He is such a famous man because when you think of Enigma, you think of him. He is the one credited, the one considered the champion who was able to finally crack the uncrackable uh, Enigma machine based on the items that was captured and also the work by the earlier, the Polish cryptanalyst and the, you know, the code book and the machine. And even that, it was still a lot of work. Alan Turing and his top-notch code breakers, they were so smart, worked for many, many, many hours, day and night. And then finally, they were able to crack this machine. So all thanks to this incredible man. Remember his name? Alan what? Turing. Remember this word, right? Now, they have to come up with machine, and this is known as the Turing machine. And let me tell you something about the Turing machine. This is the actually grandfather of all modern computers. So let me tell you that the Turing machine is actually the predecessor of today's computer, even though you may not even realize that this is actually a computer. The machine that was specially invented to help crack the Enigma code became the idea behind uh, how to create the modern computer. Now, by the way, this is how uh, the so-called machine 
you, uh, uh, was used those days. Uh, the, how huge the computer was, right? Compared to the small computer that you have in your laptop. So we have come a long way, we have come a long way. All right, number six. Now here again is another historical uh, thing that you need to be aware of because whenever people talk about cryptography, you're bound to hear about this famous thing called the code talkers. Code talkers. In other words, these people were speaking in codes. They were, they were not writing in codes, they were speaking in codes, right? And when was code talking first used? So then let me tell you the story behind the famous code talkers. Now, first thing first, code talkers refer to a group of people who live in America, and this is what we call the Native American. Sometimes we call it the Native Indians, okay? The original people of America, we call them the Native Americans, or sometimes people like to call them uh, the Indians. These were drafted into, so, into the army. You know why? Because their language was so rare that it could actually be used as a code. Because nobody know what they were talking about. So, so the, the army was really smart. They actually used a real language used by this tribe, all right? Uh, there were many tribes in America, the Native Americans, and used their language to send secret, secret messages over the radio, right? Remember using the native tongue. And guess what? Now, by the way, this picture is that of the Navajo, the Navajo uh, code talkers during World War II in, in Saipan. And the Japanese were trying to crack the message and they could not understand what on earth was being said because the language was so foreign. The language was so alien. Nobody had ever heard such strange words coming up before. Remember, this is actually a very rare language, very rare, used by the Native American. Their service was very valuable, all right? Now, by the way, these are actual pictures of code talkers because it increased the security of communication between US soldiers during World War II. And the Japanese forces, their, their department, their so-called intelligence, uh, were not able to crack the code used by these code talkers because, as I said, the language of the native Indians was so, so rare, very, very rare, right? Now, the first group of code talkers were actually the Choctaw Indians, all right? And this is the picture of the first group during World War, World War I. So this is the original code talkers from the Choctaw tribe. And they were the first group to be trained during World War I to send coded messages using their language, all right? Now, in fact, one very famous major, an army officer during World War II in the Battle of Iwo Jima, you know, uh, in Japan, mentioned that, you know, look at, by the way, he was a signal officer in charge of communication. He said that during the war, were it not for the Nawo, Nawaho, he's talking about the code talkers, those uh, Native American. The Marine, the army would never have taken or captured Iwo Jima. It's all because of this incredible Native Indians, because of their message that helped to make the message secret. The Japanese have no idea what the American were doing. So notice what he said again, were it not for the Nawaho, which is the the American Indians, okay, the, those code talkers. The army, the marine would never have taken or captured Iwo Jima. So that just shows to you how important this coded message were. In fact, there is a Hollywood movie, I don't know if some of you may have seen it, called The Wind Talker, which actually talks about the actual story of the, the so-called uh, code talker. Because the way they talk sounds like wind blowing, that's why it's called wind talker, all right? Question seven, okay. Why was the Navajo language particularly useful as a code? Why did they settle on the Navajo, Navajo language, right? If, at first it was dropped out, but finally the American army settled on using Navajo, Navajo language. Why? During World War II. Now, let me give you the reason. First of all, very few people outside of the Navajo, Navajo tribe, out of outside this community, had ever learned to speak the language. It was spoken only among the Navajo Indian in their reservation, in the place where they stayed. So at the outbreak of World War II, less than 30 non-Navajo Navajo people, which are, and all of them are not Japanese, okay, who understand the language. In other words, there were only 30 people outside of the community who could actually understand them, and they were all living in America, and none of them were Japanese, okay? So that's why, uh, the American army chose their language. 
right? Another thing, the Nahuang language was an unwritten language. Now, please remember this word. What is so special about the Nahuang language is an unwritten language. There are no dictionary, no publication, no books in the Nahuang language, right? So you cannot find anything to learn that language because there was no publication on that language. It was a spoken language. It's not a written language. And number three, their language was so complex. Their grammar was extremely complex. The syntax and the tonal quality, making it a very unintelligible language. Yeah, anyone, yeah. Making it an un unintelligible language to anyone who is not part of the community. All right. Okay. So this make it very, very difficult to crack the message. All right. Now we come to question eight and then nine. And then after that, we'll come to the actual codes itself. Number eight. What is the Rosetta Stone? And why is the discovery of this stone so important? Right? Now, again, this has something to do with coding and decoding again. Now, the Rosetta Stone, today you will actually see it exhibited in the British Museum. And I've actually been there. I saw it. And I tell you, this is probably the most important uh, historical artifact in the British Museum. This was. An uh, ancient stele, an Egyptian stele, which is actually a stone containing messages written in three different languages, okay? And it was actually a decree, an order issued by Ptolemy V, which is an Egyptian pharaoh, right? And it was issued in the city of Memphis, right? It was issued in the city of Memphis, right? Now, the stone, let me tell you something, uh, helped to decode the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, which was totally unreadable and unintelligible for centuries. Now, let me tell you about the Egyptian hieroglyphs, okay? Let me show you the picture, all right? Now, this is how the hieroglyph looks like. If you go to Egypt, you'll see all this strange thing. And nobody could understand what this thing was. It was considered a dead language. You understand what I'm saying? All right? You see, this is how the ancient hieroglyph looks like. But because of the discovery of this stone, okay, which was actually accidentally discovered by the French soldiers in 1799 at the place called Rosetta. That's why this stone is called the Rosetta. Then to their amazement, guess what happened? They discovered, wow, this ancient rock, this stele, had three different languages written on it, including the hieroglyphs, which is the ancient Egyptian language that nobody understood what it was to so consider dead language. And then the other language was Demotic, and then the third language was Greek. Now, Greek, people still understand. So as a result of this stone, now watch very carefully, as I told you, there were three languages on it, all right? The first one is actually the hieroglyphs. Now, the top one is hieroglyphs, all those cartoon characters. You know, remember those strange little creatures and the cartoonic uh, depiction? And the second one was also a dead language used by the Egyptian. It's called the Demotic language. It's an Egyptian. Now, the third one, people understood because this was Greek, right? Ancient Greek. And because of this stone, now we actually have a tool using what we know, which is Greek, to understand what we don't know, which is Demotic language and most of all, hieroglyphs. And it all started with this man, okay? Thomas Young, an uh, English physicist, he was the first one to show that the hieroglyphs written here were actually uh, talking about a royal uh, name who was actually Ptolemy. Now, somehow, this incredible smart fellow could figure out from here that this is actually talking about the name of a king, and he was Ptolemy, and that was the starting point of uh, the discovery of how to understand hieroglyphs. Now, then, he was left to this very smart scholar, Francois Champollion, who is actually a French scholar now. When he heard what Thomas Young did, guess what happened? He spent a lot of time using the Greek on the Rosetta Stone to try to understand what was written on the uh, what was written by the Egyptian using hieroglyphs and also the Demotic language. And it was because of his incredible scholarship. Today, 
the ancient hieroglyph which was for so long a dead language is now what we call a language we can understand right so today we actually can read hieroglyphs if you are what we call an egyptologist okay you will now begin to know that sometimes uh, it talks about sound and sometimes it actually conveys a message now of course you have to be an egyptian egyptology scholar to be able to read uh, hieroglyphs but thanks to the rosetta stone today what happened an ancient language has now come back alive remember hieroglyph was an ancient language have now come alive so that's the thing you need to remember all right question nine and this is the last question for the theory part and now we'll go to the the practical part that the, the more interesting part all right in the bible we also see a lot of coded messages those symbols used in bible prophecy are all codes 